he left Purdue after one of the most dominant seasons in NCAA history, and translated that into being the first overall pick ahead of great players like Grant Hill and Jason Kidd. And maybe it's a bit unlucky for him that his name will always be attached to those players, as by comparison, he usually draws the short end of the stick, as both Hill and Kidd were generational talents with incredible versatility. While Robinson was an elite scorer, but that was most of his appeal, and his old school game wasn't as exciting as a lot of the other stars in the league. On top of that, he came in with a bad rap, after pursuing an incredibly lucrative contract which had many painting him as greedy or delusional. But Glenn Robinson knew how high his stock was, and tried to get the most out of it, and why wouldn't he? And when it came time to prove his worth, he quietly and consistently averaged over 21 points per game for his 8 seasons in Milwaukee, and over 20 a game for his entire career. He truly had a complete offensive repertoire. His playstyle may not have been the most exciting, but it also helped him maximize his career contributions as injuries stole a lot of his athleticism. He was stuck in a small market most of his career, but was a key player in the Milwaukee Bucks' short-lived success at the turn of the millennium. But just as quick as they came together, they fell apart. And when it was all said and done, Robinson never really seemed to get the full appreciation he deserved as a player. So today, we're going to jog your memory and appreciate the career of Glenn Big Dog Robinson. Glenn Robinson attended Roosevelt High School in his hometown of Gary, Indiana. At Roosevelt, he led the team to multiple sectional and regional titles, capping off his high school career by leading them to a 30-1 record with the state championship as a senior, as he would average 25.6 points and 14.1 rebounds per game. En route to being named Indiana's 1991 Mr. Basketball, as well as a McDonald's All-American. Robinson would go on to attend Purdue University under Hall of Fame coach Gene Cady. And it was at Purdue where he would reportedly receive the nickname Big Dog by a school custodian. Unfortunately for Robinson, he struggled academically during high school and his grades as well as his SAT scores weren't high enough for him to be eligible in his freshman year, leading to him redshirting the 1992 season, which was initially very difficult for Robinson as he would say he almost gave up and went home. But things would change, and he would prepare over the summer against NBA players like Tim Hardaway and Kevin Duckworth in the Malcolm X Summer League in Chicago. Robinson would prove he was worth the wait in the 93 season, as he would finish first in the Big Ten in scoring, as well as be top 10 in rebounding, steals, blocks, field goal, and free throw percentage, and would even finish ninth in the nation in scoring, all while recording 13 double-doubles on the season. On paper, Purdue didn't look like one of the most talented teams in the nation, as outside of Robinson, they had only one other player who averaged double figures, albeit a good player in Conzo Martin, but they weren't filled with future NBA talent like some of the other teams. Robinson would lead the Boilermakers to an 18-10 record, which would be enough for a tournament berth, where they would play Rhode Island in the first round. However, they would disappointingly have their season ended quickly, as Rhode Island would win the game with a balanced scoring attack, as four players finished in double figures. Purdue did not have the same output though. Eight players other than Robinson would score in this game for a combined total of 32 points, but Robinson alone would put up 36, on 70% from the field and 50% from three, but would foul out in the final minute of the game. So Robinson did all he could, but the rest of the team didn't give him much help. But for his regular season, he averaged about 24 points, 9 rebounds, 2 assists, and 2 steals per game, en route to being named a consensus second team All-American. Robinson could have declared for the draft after his great season and still been a lottery pick, but he decided to stay as he didn't want to leave his teammates hanging, after feeling as though they didn't accomplish anything the season prior. So Robinson returned for his junior season and would put together one of the most dominant single seasons in NCAA history. Purdue would start the season by winning the Great Alaskan Shootout, with Robinson winning MVP of the tournament. The Boilermakers would start the year 14-0, which included Robinson knocking down a baseline jumper with under 10 seconds left in their Big Ten opener at Northwestern, to give Purdue the win. In the second last game of the regular season, Purdue would travel to Ann Arbor to play the Wolverines and their Fab Four, since Weber had left for the draft after the 93 season. Michigan had a half-game lead in the conference race, but Robinson would stun Michigan when he hit a game-winning buzzer beater to give Purdue the half-game lead in the conference race with one game versus Illinois left. And no one was stopping Robinson from bringing home the Big Ten Championship, as in his final home game, he dropped a career-high 49 points to give Purdue the win over Illinois, as they would end the year with a 26-4 record, 
which included an undefeated 12-0 record in non-conference play. Purdue would enter the tournament as the number three team in the nation, leading to an automatic bid and a one seed. Purdue would have a much better first round showing, as Robinson would again dominate with 31 and 11 on 50% from the field and over 71% from three, but this time would get some scoring help, including 20 points from Martin and 11 from guard Matt Waddell. Round two would be another Purdue win, as they defeated Alabama behind Robinson's 33 points and 11 rebounds on nearly 59% shooting. The Sweet 16 would be Robinson's best, as he would lead Purdue to a five point win over Kansas by scoring 44 points and would get help from Martin, who put up 29. The Elite Eight brought a matchup with Duke and their star, Grant Hill. But in what could have been a great matchup between two future top draft picks, the two stars would struggle, as Hill managed just 11 points on 3 of 11 from the field, and Robinson, who was suffering from a back strain which he sustained versus Kansas, would put up just 13 on 6 of 22 from the field, as the game would end with Duke taking the victory, knocking Purdue out of the tournament and ending Robinson's season. Although an incredible season, they would see him sweep all the major individual rewards en route to being named National College Player of the Year, as well as a consensus first team All-American behind his nation leading scoring average of 30.3 points to go along with 10.1 rebounds per game, which would be good for second in the Big Ten. And he would round it out with about two assists and one and a half steals per game. With the first pick in the 1994 NBA draft, the Milwaukee Bucks select Glenn Robinson from Purdue University. Robinson would become the first Purdue Boilermaker to be selected first overall since Joe Barry Carroll was the Warriors' first pick in the 1980 draft. Robinson would be selected above Jason Kidd and Grant Hill and would find himself in the news pretty quickly as he and the Bucks would get in a bit of a contract dispute over Robinson's request for a 13-year, $100 million contract. And even though Robinson's demands were unheard of, the Bucks didn't handle it as professionally as they should have. The Bucks owner, Herb Cole, was a US Senator and in the middle of a campaign for re-election, where he was hoping to appeal to the average person. But giving Robinson that contract may have given the wrong message to voters. So the Bucks would instead blindside Robinson by going as far as to hold a press conference to announce to the public that he had rejected their counteroffer of nine years and 60 million. So now, before even suiting up for the Bucks, Robinson had already been painted as a bit of a bad guy by the organization that was supposed to be fully committed to him. But ultimately, Robinson and the Bucks would agree to a fully guaranteed 10-year, $68 million deal on November 4th, which still stands as the richest rookie contract in NBA history. Robinson would join a Bucks team coming off a 20-62 and 62 season without much to be excited about. However, they did have one good piece who had been acquired in the previous year's draft in power forward Vin Baker, who was coming off of a first team all rookie selection. Even though Robinson was a rookie, he didn't play like one, as he would be the team's leading scorer and form what looked to be a potential great duo alongside Baker. The team would improve by 14 wins, but a 34 and 48 record wasn't quite good enough, as they would miss the playoffs by a single game. Robinson's season included him being named rookie of the month twice, as well as leading all rookies in scoring at 21.9 points per game which would also be good for 10th in the entire league. However, he would finish third in Rookie of the Year voting behind co-Rookie of the Year's Grant Hill and Jason Kidd. Robinson showed that he would have no problem producing in the NBA the same way he had produced in college, as he would record 11 games with at least 30 points and pull down a career-high 17 rebounds in a February 18th win versus Chicago. And he would also play in the Rookie Challenge, recording a team-high 21 points. But Robinson's great rookie season would end with him earning a first team all rookie selection behind averages of nearly 22 points, a career high 6.4 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. The 95 offseason included a brief lockout that brought a few changes, including the implementation of the rookie wage scale, which was largely a result of Robinson's massive rookie deal. The Bucks would regress in the 96 season after some interesting roster changes as they would trade Alton Lister and Todd Day, who was coming off a career year, just eight games into the season to Boston for Sherman Douglas. Additionally, they would ship away Eric Murdoch, who had played what would end up being his best basketball of his career during his three seasons in Milwaukee, to the expansion Grizzlies after nine games. So this left more of the scoring responsibility on Robinson and Baker, but they would deliver, as they each played and started in all 82 games, 
combining for over 41 points per game. Robinson would drop to 18th in the league in scoring, but with him and Baker, the Bucks had two of the top 20 scorers in the league, but would finish just 25 and 57, as their defense was below average and they didn't have much scoring outside of their star duo, finishing with the sixth worst offense in the league. Robinson continued his scoring as he had 10 games with at least 30 points and only three games where he didn't reach double figures. And on top of that, his passing was on display as he recorded his first and only 10 assist game of his career to go along with 20 points in a March 22nd loss to Miami. But Robinson's second season would see him average about 20 points, six rebounds, and a career high 3.6 assists per game. Robinson was also supposed to suit up for Dream Team 3 at the 96 Olympics this summer, but had to withdraw from the team because of an Achilles injury. The Bucks made a huge acquisition in the NBA draft as they used their fourth overall pick to select star point guard Stefan Marbury out of Georgia Tech, but then traded him to the Timberwolves for their fifth overall pick, shooting guard Ray Allen out of Connecticut. So going into the 97 season, the Bucks had arguably the best young trio in the game, with Vin Baker coming off two straight all-star appearances, a third-year Glenn Robinson, who was proving to be a perennial 20-point-per-game scorer, and a sweet-shooting rookie with incredible athleticism in Ray Allen. And these three would perform as expected. Robinson and Baker each put up about 21 per game as they finished as the 13th and 14th best scorers in the league. And Allen would add around 13 points as they were the only three players to average double figures, which would bring the Bucks back to the problem they had the previous year as they had a below average defense and a bottom 10 offense that found them finishing with yet another losing record at 33 and 49. Robinson would again have 11 games with at least 30 points, but this season would see him crack 40 points three times, including a 44 point performance on nearly 70% shooting in a December 7th win versus Washington. So yet another season would end without a postseason appearance, as the Bucks seemed to have all the pieces they would need, but it just wasn't working. And Robinson's third year ended with him averaging about 21 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. The Bucks felt something needed to change, and were involved in a blockbuster three-team trade on September 25th, which saw three All-Stars change teams, as they would ship Vin Baker to the Sonics, who would send Sean Kemp to the Cavs, while the Cavs would send point guard Terrell Brandon to Milwaukee. So the new look trio had subbed out Baker for Brandon, and this Bucks team probably would have been pretty good, if they could have stayed healthy, as three of their starters, including Robinson and Brandon, missed at least 25 games this year due to injury, as this would be the first season of Robinson's career that he would miss significant time due to injury. Allen played 82 games and upped his scoring to over 19 a game, but the Bucks 36 and 46 finish is more frustrating when you look at how good Brandon and Robinson were playing when they were able to suit up, as Brandon was averaging a then career high in assists and an overall career high in steals, while Robinson averaged a career high 23.4 points per game, which would have placed him as the number four scorer in the league, but his 56 games wouldn't be enough to qualify. And he would also do this quite efficiently, as he shot a then career high 47% from the field and 38.5% from three, and would still drop at least 30 in 11 games. And his regular season would end with him averaging about 23 and a half points, five and a half rebounds, and three assists per game. The 1998 offseason was extended due to the lockout, but when the season finally kicked off, it would kick off the most successful stretch of Milwaukee basketball in 15 years. The trio of Robinson, Allen, and Brandon would be intact to start the year, but the Bucks had made a big personnel splash as they now employed George Carl as their head coach. The Bucks had a strong start to the season and were sitting at 12 and five after beating Carl's former team in the Supersonics. But then another blockbuster three-team trade would be completed on March 12th. They would see Brandon traded to the T-Wolves, who sent Stefan Marbury to the Nets, while New Jersey gave the Bucks Sam Cassell, as they would now roll out a third different trio in as many seasons, with Cassell taking over for Brandon. Obviously in the long run, this turned out to be a great trade, but it was a little strange seeing as how the Bucks had gotten off to such a great start and Cassell had missed most of the season with injury prior to the trade and would go on to play just four games off the bench for Milwaukee in the regular season. So Robinson and Allen would naturally be expected to pick up the slack, but they would both see drops in their scoring from the year before. However, they had a more complete offense this year with veterans like Del Curry and Armin Gilliam coming off the bench and would receive scoring from second year forward Tim Thomas, who they acquired from the 76ers mid-season. Additionally, 
this would be the best defense the Bucks had during Robinson's time with the team, as they finished 11th in the league. And this resulted in the first postseason appearance of Robinson's career, which also meant the first winning season of his career, as Milwaukee finished 28 and 22 and would play the Pacers in round one. Cassell would return as a starter for the playoffs, and fans would get a better idea of what was yet to come, as Robinson, Allen, and Cassell combined to average over 58 points per game for the series. But this would be a series in which experience proved to be the deciding factor, as the playoff experienced Pacers swept the Bucks in three games. However, two games would be decided by single digits, with the Bucks losing game two by a single point. Robinson had a good first playoff series, as he put up around 21 and 8. However, he would be slightly overshadowed by Allen, and both Allen and Cassell would shoot at least 50%, while Robinson barely shot over 41%. But nonetheless, this was progress, and the Bucks were looking forward to building on it. And the 99 season ended with Robinson averaging about 18 and a half points, 6 rebounds, and 2 assists per game, as well as averaging a career high 39.2% from deep. The 2000 season would allow the Bucks to really show what their big three was all about, as the trio combined to average over 61 points per game. However, Allen would surpass Robinson as the team's leading scorer, marking the first time since Allen was drafted that Robinson wasn't the team's top scorer. Robinson would, however, have the highest field goal percentage out of the trio, on a career high 47.2%. The Bucks would have a pretty average season, as they were now playing more like a typical George Carl team, boasting the league's fifth best offense but they didn't have the same elite defenders that Carl had in Seattle, so the team finished with the 23rd ranked defense. The trio was healthy all year, as they each played and started at least 81 games. Robinson and Allen would each be voted to the All-Star game for the first time in their careers, where Robinson would put up 10 points off the bench. And this season would also include Robinson hitting a career-high 6 threes in a February 15th win versus Dallas. The Bucks' playoff hopes weren't looking good, as they were sitting at 31 and 36 late in the season but would end up going 11-4 the rest of the way to secure the 8th and final playoff spot at 42-40, where they would get a rematch with Indiana. The series would go the full 5 games before the Bucks would lose by a single point in Game 5, after Travis Best hit a clutch 3 for Indiana with less than 20 seconds left in the game. But the Bucks trio would struggle more in this series than they did against the Pacers the previous year, as all 3 shot below 45%, with Robinson shooting the lowest at 40.5%. And although Allen averaged 22 a game, both Cassell and Robinson couldn't crack 16 points, with Robinson putting up the lowest average out of the three, as he had just one game where he scored more than 18, and three games where he scored just 11, including the Game 5 loss, in which he went 4 of 16 from the field. So the Bucks season would end at the hands of the Pacers for the second year in a row, and Robinson would end with averages of about 21 points, 6 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. The Big 3 was even better in 01, as they combined for over 62 points per game, and the Bucks were second in scoring and first in offensive rating, as they would also receive good contributions from Tim Thomas and Lindsey Hunter off the bench. Robinson would play 76 games and tie with Allen as the team's top scorer, and would do so on nearly 47% shooting. However, he couldn't find his 3-point stroke this year, as he shot a career low 29.9%. But his performance this season would still be enough to earn him his second straight All-Star selection, along with Allen, where Robinson would drop 8 off the bench in what would be his last All-Star appearance. Robinson would also have a great performance in a February 25th blowout of Golden State, when he scored a career-high 45 points on nearly 67% shooting. And overall, the Bucks would have their best season since Robinson was drafted, as they finished with a 52-30 record. But this success wasn't always evident, as the Bucks actually started the year 3-9. Regardless, they would draw Tracy McGrady and the Orlando Magic in round one of the playoffs. T-Mac would thoroughly outplay Robinson, as he would average nearly 34 points for the series, and infamously refer to Robinson as a puppy dog. Allen had an incredible series, putting up an efficient 24.5 points per game, while Cassell would put up 22 of his own, but on 35% shooting. Unfortunately, Robinson would continue his underwhelming playoff performances, as he would average less than 15 points on under 35% shooting. However, the more complete Bucks would still win the series in four games, setting up a second round matchup versus Charlotte. The Bucks would go up 2-0 to start the series before losing three in a row, but would luckily win games six and seven to win the series and advance to the Eastern Conference Finals. Robinson didn't have a good start to the series, as he was averaging 17 points on less than 40% shooting after the first two games. But after a solid game three, and not so solid game four, 
he would close out the series on a high note, scoring at least 22 points in games 5 through 7 on over 52% shooting each game, which included 29 point performances in games 6 and 7, which would end up being his postseason career highs, as he would up his scoring to 22 points per game and shoot over 46% for the series. The conference finals brought the Philadelphia 76ers, led by MVP Allen Iverson and Defensive Player of the Year Dikembe Mutombo. Allen would again be the team's top scorer this series, with Robinson in second at close to 20 per game. But his shooting would drop below 44%, and Cassell would be even less efficient. With the series tied 2-2, Robinson would have a chance to win the game, but would miss a baseline jumper, as the Sixers went up 3-2. The Bucks would win Game 6, but then lose Game 7 and be eliminated. However, this series is one of the most controversial playoff series in NBA history, and Bill Simmons said it best when he likened the 0-2 Lakers King series to George Foreman and this series to Ernie Shavers, as only one seems to be remembered consistently. But this series had a lot of controversial moments, such as head-scratching no-calls and violations in games 1 and 4, which were both Sixers wins, as well as the Sixers receiving over 33% more free throws than Milwaukee across the series, yet also receiving 75% less technicals and 100% less flagrant foul calls. Robinson would also not make a trip to the free throw line until game 5, and still only shoot 16 for the series. And on top of that, the Bucks' most reliable big man, Scott Williams, received a flagrant foul 1 in game 6, which was then upgraded to a flagrant 2 after the game had ended, which resulted in a one-game suspension, keeping him out of game 7, as the Bucks lost. And to rub salt in the wounds, Carl and Allen were fined a combined $85,000 after suggesting the series was rigged to ensure a small market team like Milwaukee didn't make it to the finals versus the big market Lakers. But the Bucks season was over, and for his regular season, Robinson averaged about 22 points, a career-high 6.9 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. 2002 saw regression as their big three dealt with injuries, with Allen missing 13 games and Robinson missing 16. Allen and Robinson would still both average over 20 a game as the trio continued to put up over 60 points combined. The Bucks also had some new pieces as they had signed Anthony Mason in the offseason, who was coming off an all-star year with Miami and was looked at as a great addition to the Bucks' already elite team. And everything was looking good as the team started 9-1. But then things started to fall apart as Mason began questioning the offensive philosophy, believing that the Bucks couldn't win without a consistent inside game. And as Allen would say, it eventually got to the point where Mason would show no respect to Carl and blatantly ignore him in the middle of games. On top of that, the Bucks went on a five-game losing streak after their great start, and Carl would criticize Robinson for his effort in their most recent loss, but would do so publicly, which Robinson didn't appreciate, and would feel like Carl was using him as the scapegoat for their losing, and even going as far as to call Carl a coward for going to the media instead of to Robinson. And on top of this, Robinson was playing through a variety of injuries, including the knee tendonitis that would plague him for a lot of his career. The Bucks would be 28 and 18 at the All-Star break, but the aforementioned injuries to Allen and Robinson, along with Tim Thomas and much improved second year guard Michael Redd also missing time, resulted in the Bucks going 13 and 23 the rest of the way, finishing at 41 and 41 and missing the playoffs, as Robinson's year would end with him averaging about 20 and a half points, 6 rebounds and 2.5 and assists per game. There was irreparable damage to the Bucks, and it seemed as though their Big 3 era was going to come to an abrupt end. Many suspected Robinson to be the first domino to fall, as reports came out that Carl had been lobbying for Robinson to be traded throughout the season. But Robinson's good relationship with owner Herb Cole had helped him remain on the team. But then, Robinson was arrested for some pretty serious offenses on July 20th, so he had pretty much made his own bed at that point, and was traded to the Hawks just a couple weeks later for Tony Kukoc, Leon Smith, and a pick that would become TJ Ford. And after the trade, Robinson would be in headlines again, as he had some choice words for Ray Allen, who had come out after the trade and called Robinson a ball hog and the reason for the team's poor chemistry, which Robinson didn't appreciate, as he would refer to Allen as a coward as well. The Hawks looked like they were trying to form their own big three, as Robinson joined Jason Terry and Sharif Abdurrahim, who were coming off a season averaging over 40 points combined. And the scoring would be there for this trio, as they would combine to average nearly 58 points per game, with Robinson as the team's top scorer. But that was the extent of the Hawks' offense, as no one else cracked double figures. And aside from having the league's leading shot blocker in Theo Ratliff, 
this wasn't exactly a team full of players known for their defense, as the Hawks would finish with a bottom 10 defense and below average offense en route to a 35-47 and 47 record. Robinson would also miss 13 games this year with lingering injuries, which were really starting to catch up to him and make it more difficult for him to get to his spots or drive past guys, leading to him shooting a career low 43.2% from the field. But he would shoot a career high 87.6% from the free throw line in his final season of putting up over 20 points per game. And for the regular season, he would average about 21 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Robinson would find himself in another offseason trade as he was sent to Philly on July 23rd as part of a 14 deal. The Sixers hoped that Robinson would be a solid scoring option to take some of the load off of Allen Iverson. But unfortunately, they were a few years too late in acquiring Robinson as he was really starting to break down. He would play in 42 games for the Sixers and be second on the team in scoring behind Iverson and was shooting roughly 45%. But after missing time throughout the season with injuries, he would opt for season-ending elbow surgery in early March, as the Sixers were 24 and 38 at the time and out of playoff contention, ultimately finishing 33 and 49. And for his shortened season, Robinson would put up about 16 and a half points, four and a half rebounds, and one and a half assists per game. Robinson would play in five preseason games for the Sixers before the 05 season, but would be placed on the injured list on November 1st with ankle tendonitis and wouldn't play a game for the Sixers this year before he was traded to New Orleans on February 24th for a package that included Jamal Mashburn, who never played for the Sixers before injuries forced him into retirement. Robinson would immediately be waived by the Hornets, but then sign with San Antonio on April 4th to hopefully provide the team with some scoring off the bench and another body on the defensive end. To fill in for the injured Devin Brown, Robinson would play nine regular season games with San Antonio coming off the bench but would still average 10 points per game, including a 23-point game on 9 of 11 shooting versus Memphis in the second last game of the year. The Spurs finished 60-22 and, and would beat the Nuggets in the first round, followed by the Sonics in round 2, then the Suns in the Western Conference Finals, to set up a finals matchup with the defending champion Pistons, who they would beat in a great 7-game series. Robinson would have less of a role throughout the playoffs, as he appeared in 13 games and played under 9 minutes per game. He would have a high point in a Game 1 win versus Seattle, where he would score 16 off the bench. And in his 11th, and what would be his final season, Robinson would go out as an NBA champion, and would end his very abbreviated season, averaging about 10 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 1 assist per game. And Glenn Robinson would end his career as one of the great scorers of his era, yet one that barely seems to get brought up anymore. He averaged over 20 for his entire career, and did so with a throwback type game. It was starting to become less and less common as his years in the league went on. He was a great shooter from three-point land and in the mid-range, and his ability to finish with either power or finesse was underrated for someone as big as him. And his athleticism was sneaky before injuries caught up to him. He was never a great defender, but playing through so many injuries as his career went on saw him unfairly getting labeled as lazy in his later years. But he still had active hands and a good feel for jumping passing lanes as he averaged over a steal per game for his career. But he played the majority of his career in a small market. And on top of that, he wasn't the most marketable guy to begin with as his game wasn't as exciting as others in the league. Then Ray Allen came along and quickly overshadowed him, which made it easy for fans to overlook the incredible consistency of Robinson. He was a crucial piece in the Bucks Eastern Conference Finals run and although it was short-lived, was one-third of one of the most potent trios of the 21st century. He stayed consistent till the end, never averaging less than double figures, and capped it all off with an NBA title. But all the years leading up to that were filled with some of the most effortless looking scoring you could imagine. But that's it for today's episode on the big dog, Glenn Robinson. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for plenty more videos like this one. If you like this one, check out these videos on a couple of the point guards he played with during his time with the Bucks. Thanks for watching and see you next time.